Hello everybody and welcome back to the Ultimate Fashion History for an episode in our series, History in Colour, where we look back at past decades and past centuries and I try to analyse why people were so drawn to the palette that they were, where these colours came from, where these palettes came from, and how it all applies to fashion. And in this episode, brace yourselves, we are looking at the most colourful decade of all time, the 1980s. I have come with a few of my own theories. You can tell me if you agree or not. And to make it even more fun, you know how I always like to show images of real people when I teach fashion history in the classroom. And I always try to include real people in my episodes for you guys here. What I did, I invited members of the Ultimate Fashion Histories Facebook group who were around in the 80s to send photographs of themselves wearing some of these signature colors and believe me when it comes to color in the 80s it is not all neon and primaries although there is a lot of neon and primaries anyway in the 80s video may have killed the radio star but it didn't kill color brace yourselves and enjoy i don't think there has ever been a decade in which color was counted upon as much as it was in the excessive and eccentric 1980s from multicolor to no color at all and everything in between. I can't possibly cover every color or color combo of the 80s, so I'll be speaking to the iconic color waves of the era. But with so much color to get through, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of 1980s fashion, and I'm going to take it for granted that we all know who the new romantics were and the blitz kids and the preppies and all of that. But as you can see, we have episodes on all that good stuff here on the UFH anyway. To understand the palette of the decade, we have to remember the decade itself. Colour, just like fashion, is not an island, it's a response. And colour in the 80s responded to what was happening in the world. This was the era of Reagan, of Thatcher, of trickle-down economics, of Reaganomics in the States, of the unemployment crisis in Britain. And while an increasing number of people were struggling financially, possibly an equal number enjoyed tremendous financial success in the 80s. It was the era of the yuppie, after all, those young urban professionals who played the market to win and carved their own culture in the process. Whether one had it or one didn't, the idea of money culturally dominated the decade. We watched the wealthy on TV with those lavish evening soaps like Dallas and Dynasty, and numerous movies of the era were centered on either acquiring or losing or gaining money. Most notably in the movie Wall Street, when Michael Douglas in his role as Gordon Gecko tells us, greed is good. Even Madonna told us we were living in a material world. And in a material world, you can't have too much of anything. You can't have too many sequins. You can't have too many feathers. You can't have too much lace. You can never wear too many accessories. And you can never have too much color. In the 80s, you went big or you went home. Hair got big. Clothes got big. Beatboxes got big. And it naturally follows that color would get big. There were even brands that rose in the 80s because of their use of color. Sure, Fiorucci was founded in the 70s and Benetton and Esprit in the 60s, but it was the color craze of the 80s that saw these labels peak. Patrick Kelly based his sadly brief career on his use of color in the 80s. Versace and La Croix were both founded in the 70s, but it was the 80s and their embrace of color that put them on the major fashion map. And what about Swatch? But where did the 80s love of color originate? And what made us think it was okay to do this? Well, with history and hindsight, we now all recognize and appreciate the enormous impact of the Memphis group on the overarching 1980s aesthetic. This group of Italian furniture designers and graphic designers and textile designers who dubbed themselves the Memphis group and who blended ideas born of Bauhaus with a kitschy 50s feel in bright and playful colors. The Memphis group also took inspiration from the American New Wave scene and vice versa, both having a tremendous impact on how the 80s looked and certainly on 80s fashion. Look at this dress by Cardin or this color block dress 
by Lacroix. And we can really see the Memphis influence, can't we? And how much both of these creations relied upon colour to make them work. And just consider the original MTV logos, pure Memphis. I was 15 years old in 1980 and 24 when the decade ended. And looking back, I remember just how much colour mattered to people in the 80s. Girlfriends would lay claim on their signature colour and none of their friends were allowed to wear the same colour. The sitcom The Goldbergs certainly it pokes affectionate fun at the 80s trend of families wearing identical colours, but families actually did use colour often to unite. Be they a family like this or a family like this? And here is Ultimate Fashion History group member Erica in the 80s with her mum and her sister all dressed in identical orange. Well, now that I've set the scene, let's look at the decade's major colour waves. Let's start with primary and secondary colours, all those reds, blues, yellows and greens that mark the decade. Now, when we do this palette in class, when my students see these primaries, they say, sure, Prof H, these are fun and they're bright, but they also say they're sort of childish and not very cool. And that's when I have to explain to them that, believe it or not, this bright, bold palette of the 80s was actually considered very cool and people who wore bright colours, especially at the start of the decade, were considered rather edgy. This is because this palette had its origins in hip subcultures. Think of the multicoloured graffiti on early 80s subway trains and of course this colour wave was associated with the burgeoning hip hop scene, all of those reds, yellows and blues. And fine art of the era also dipped its brush into a palette of primaries. Look at this painting by Basquiat and look at this painting by Julian Schnabel. Consider their use of reds, blues and greens. And in the 1980s, you could not actually get much cooler than Basquiat and Julian Schnabel. And at the trendiest end of the fashion register, primary and secondary colours were already being used by Vivian Westwood in her pirate collection. Kenzo, and Kenzo had been using primary colours all along, and Stephen Sprouse. So this was cool stuff, right? And the birth of MTV let people know that their pop stars wore primaries. Here's the Human League, here's one of my 80s favourites, Duran Duran, and here's Michael Jackson, who often rocked red, as we all know. Think of how many album covers of the decade used primary colours, and what would Boy George have done without them? It took no time at all for these primary colours to appear on everything from homeware to advertising. The iconic Pac-Man machine, a video game, was worked in primary colours. Multicoloured Skittles debuted in the 80s. Look at the Go-Go's and what they're wearing on this Rolling Stone cover. And even Mr. T pitied the fool who didn't wear primaries. And fashion embraced this colour wave enormously, bright reds and greens and blues and yellows appearing everywhere, often combined. High fashion also embraced the primary palette. Look at this blue suit by Thierry Mugler, this green Gucci, this red Chanel, this yellow Dior, all of it combined here by Bill Blass. This colour wave was strong and it was bold, and so it lent itself perfectly to the power dressing of the era, women crashing through that glass ceiling with their massive shoulder padded jackets in reds and yellows and blues and greens. All primary colours were popular, but perhaps the most favoured was red, which was worked across all fashion strata and worn by very different people. Here's Chrissy Hind in her iconic red leather jacket. Here's Princess Diana in military red. Nancy Reagan wore this shade of red so often, it was actually called Reagan Red. And the red leather worn by Michael Jackson in Thriller was perhaps his most famous outfit. This bright, playful palette was also applied to makeup with bright blues, yellows and greens and, if you were Adam Ant, red stripes across your face. I loved Adam Ant. I still do, really. Another reason I personally believe that primaries were so popular in the 80s is because they resonated perfectly with the 60s revival that rose in the decade. And of course, this was the palette of the mid-1960s. Think Saint Laurent's Mondrian dress. The colours are so 60s, but they're also so 80s. 
So often, I think it's the pairing of colour that speaks to the spirit of a particular era. And these bright primary and secondary colours teamed with black really scream 1980s to me. Let me show you what I mean here. Take a look at these. Oscar de la Renta, Patrick Kelly, Bob Mackie, Moschino, Louis Ferro. All of the designers toning down the brights with black, the end result being a far more sophisticated working of the popular brights. Yet, to my mind, the most iconic pairing of a secondary colour with black in the 80s was black and green. Take a look at these. Claude Montana, Nino Ricci, Yves Saint Laurent, and I think that's Dior. Black and green was a popular pairing in the 80s. And here is UFH member Susan with a bow in the 80s, both wearing black and green. So why was this pairing so popular? Well, I have a theory. It's one of my theories. Tell me what you think. The 80s saw the dawn of computers in the workplace. I'm not suggesting that anyone paired black and green because of computers. I'm just suggesting that as computers were such a talking point, perhaps this pairing read as particularly cool and modern and even futuristic. Who knows? But you know, I love my theories. I also love my students, and whenever I ask them what colour wave they most think of when they think of the 80s, they invariably say, Prof Halle, it's neon. Neon, fluorescence, or as we called these colours back then, day glow. And there was a lot of it about, especially at the start of the decade, cassettes. Look at this day glow phone, my little pony. And I'm sure that there's a lot of you out there who grew up with Gem and the Holograms and recall all too well their fluorescent hair and wardrobe. Now, it's sort of a no-brainer to understand why neon was so popular in the 80s. How do you make colours even bigger? Make them electric. And it's also a no-brainer in terms of where this palette generated. It was really just a rollover from the new wave scene of the previous decade. Think of all those wonderful fluorescent dresses that Stephen Sprouse designed for Debbie Harry. Take a look at this B-52 album cover. But you know what? We can actually take it back even a little bit further. Think of the use of fluorescence in the British punk rock scene of the mid-1970s. But whereas in the 70s, neon only existed in the fashion domain of uber trendy subcultures, in the 80s, it was everywhere. And it lent itself particularly well to the workout attire worn by prescribers of the decade's fitness fad. High fashion also responded to neon. Here's Dior. Here's Yves Saint Laurent. Here's Oscar de la Renta. Here's Christian Lacroix. Of course, neon makeup became a trend as did nail polish, and UFH member Eddie kindly contributed this fantastic photograph of his mother on the left with her pal, both wearing neon caps and socks. Apparently, they were at a hip-hop dancing class. How fabulously 80s is that? Anyway, everybody seemed to wear a little neon, and sometimes people wore a little too much of it. Now, if I had to isolate one particular colour in the neon range that was used in fashion more than the others, looking back, I'd probably say hot pink. There was a lot of hot pink in the 80s, every level of fashion retail, and there is an awful lot of hot pink on me here at 16. I don't let self-respect or dignity get in the way of fashion history. If I did, I would not be showing you this picture. I was, what, 16? And I make no excuses because 37 years later, you all know I still love hot pink, hot coral, all of the pinks in this register. So we've looked at those bright primaries and secondaries, and we've looked at neons and fluorescents. And although these two palettes have very different color values, the message is the same. These are big colors. These are bright colors. These colors say, I'm here. Look at me. Where's the beef? They're visually somewhat assaulting, aren't they, when taken en masse? And so it's natural and obvious that the decade would have another major color wave that was the absolute opposite of brights and neons. Pastels! Oh my goodness, 
did we not adore pastels in the 80s? Sweet and soft, pastels were found on everything from tape decks to homewares, accessories and sneakers, every kind of clothing. Are pastels as cool as fluorescents? Well, in the 1980s, they certainly were. The postmodernists were working in pastels, like here with this lovely painting by one of my favorite postmodernists, David Sully. Here's Basquiat painting in pastels, and here's Schnabel. And of course, the Memphis group adored pastels. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of their stuff was inspired by the 1950s, and the 50s was a decade that also embraced the use of pastels. 1980s pastels may have been found in high art and avant-garde design, but they got their biggest boost in the decade by way of what I always term a cultural hotspot, a location that suddenly becomes hip and cool and talked about. And in the 1980s, the cultural hotspot was, without a doubt, Miami. It was in the 80s that Miami started the restoration of its South Beach Art Deco architecture, the buildings repainted in pretty pastels. Of course, the use of pastels in the Miami Vice wardrobe saw a palette revolution in menswear, and the use of pastels in the Golden Girls, also set in Miami, genuinely influenced interior design. This pretty princess loved pastels, and can I please show you this Hall and Oates album cover, or No Can Do. 80s icon Molly Ringwald was the poster child for pastels in the movie Pretty in Pink, her look in the movie imitated by high school students everywhere. Really, by the middle of the decade, pastels, often paired with pastels, were as ubiquitous as brights and applied to every conceivable garment. High fashion also responded to this love of pastels. These jackets are by Thierry Mugler. This baby pink plaid is Valentino. This powdered yellow coat is Balenciaga. I believe this baby pink prairie dress is Oscar de Laurenta. And sometimes designers one wouldn't imagine working in pastels in the 80s actually did. This fabulously tailored and unusual skirt suit is by Vivian Westwood. And again, if I had to isolate one color in the pastel range that really speaks to the 80s, I'd probably pick peach. Peach was so popular, you saw it everywhere. Here's Princess Diana in a peach skirt suit. And in 1984, Mattel jumped on the peach craze and launched its peaches and cream Barbie. But even Barbie isn't as lovely as Ultimate Fashion History group member Rita, who contributed this picture of herself in the 80s looking pretty in peach at a cafe in Rome. Soft and gentle to be sure, but I would argue that pastels also tied in with the greed is good ethos of the 80s because of the preppy trend. Brands like Lacoste brought out polo shirts in every pastel hue. Pink and green was the signature preppy combo. The pastel polo with the pop collar and the sweater thrown over the shoulder. You know what I'm talking about. These pastels, particularly if worn by men, spoke to American social elitism and summer resort wear. But in terms of this social strata, they weren't anything new, really, because I think they were just a continuation of the color concept created by social light Lily Pulitzer in the early 1960s. Pinks and greens and blues, all worn together and often worn by men. Another pastel combo that I'd maybe go as far as saying is unique to the 80s, at least in terms of just how much it was used, is the combination of seafoam and pink. Isn't this 80s? We saw so much of it. And here is UFH member April showing us how to do it right. In fact, when it came to pastels, the Ultimate Fashion History Facebook group really did me proud with their pictures from the 80s. Here's Rita in her prom dress, Danelle on the left here, Gina at the front here, little Kate with her pastel Mac and Brolly, and here's Eric's mum holding a brand new Eric and wearing a baby blue top. As you already know, pastel was a huge makeup story in the 1980s. We saw it everywhere, and the fragrance Anaïs Anaïs, which debuted in 1985, attempted to capture pastels in a scent. Casherelle based its entire perfume and publicity 
on the craze for pastels. This was the fragrance that every teenage girl in Boca Raton, Florida, where I went to high school, was wearing in the 80s. Bright's fluorescence pastels. I think these are the color waves that most people think about when thinking of 80s fashion. But there was another color wave that I think was very important that has seemingly been lost to time. And I'm calling it adventure. Inspired by movies like Indiana Jones and Romancing the Stone, as well as music videos like Duran Duran's Hungry Like the Wolf, Sisters of Mercy, Dominion, and Africa by Toto. Check out this album cover by Bucks Fizz. These colors of safaris and adventures were enormously popular in the 1980s, but this popularity seems to have been forgotten today when we think of 80s colors, which is wild because entire brands were built upon it. I know this looks like a gift shop at Adventureland at Disney World, but it's actually a 1980s Banana Republic. Before the brand mainstreamed, it started life as a safari wear store with fashion inspired by retro adventure wear and all of the colors incumbent like fawn, tan, khaki, raw linen. The colors of Gurkha shorts, pit helmets, bush vests, Jay Peterman did the same thing with their dusters, safari coats, and catalogue hyperbole. In the 1980s, this adventure look was huge. Ralph Lauren worked it to death. There was a safari dress hanging in many a woman's wardrobe. And even the designer who first did safari as a fashion trend in the 60s, Yves Saint Laurent, had another pop at it. But it didn't actually have to be a safari dress to take on this adventure palette. Khaki and olive green, tan and beige were a big part of the 80s fashion color charts. And oh looky, here I am at 16 in 1981 in my French class, in my beige culottes. And please note the glasses worn atop my adventurous straw hat. And look at the girl next to me, she's also wearing head to toe adventure colors. Now that we've covered the big palette stories, let's hone in on some particular 1980s colors, starting with the color purple, be it Tyrian, eggplant, thistle, magenta, fuchsia, heliotrope, purple offered a dramatic counterbalance to the brights, neons, and pastels of the era. Think of the album cover to Rio, for example, or really any of Patrick Nagel's work of the decade. And this is the palette we're talking about. We saw an awful lot of purple in the 80s, a lot of it in print advertising, a lot of it in makeup. In fact, purple was suddenly all around us in the 80s. Didn't it seem that video games and arcades were always in these purple hues, as were nightclubs of the era? I should know. I spent most of the 80s in nightclubs. And fashion, from high fashion to high street, would surf this color wave throughout the decade. But what were its 80s origins and why was it so popular? Well, of course, purple is the color of royalty. And in the 1980s, we were obsessed with royalty, either real royalty, TV dynasties, or pop royalty. Hey, he called himself Prince. So royal equals wealthy, purple equals royal, but I think there's a little more to it than this. Again, think Memphis Group and their love of purple. But in terms of fashion, I've got a theory that I'd like to share with you and you can tell me what you think. Because I actually think that the 80s trend for purple filtered up from some pretty way out 1980s subcultures. Purple was the signature color of the Blitz Kids and the New Romantics, those ultra trendy British youths whose theatrical dramatic take on fashion would eventually filter down to regular people who didn't dress like this at all. Also, the 1980s saw the first real wave of vintage shopping with stores like the Antique Boutique and Flip. Now, sometimes these vintage stores would buy up surplus military army wear like canvas parkas and army jackets and dye them. And no matter what color they tried to dye them, they would always turn out purple. And I should know because here I am wearing one. I'm about 15. Look at the state of me. 
So there was just a lot of these purples around at the street level of fashion in the early 1980s that, in my opinion anyway, eventually expanded to every fashion strata. Now, these aren't colours that I am particularly fond of, yet I wore them throughout the 80s. Here I am in about 1986 at the height of my psychedelic revival moment. Believe me, there was not a trend in the 80s that I didn't throw myself at. And here's me at the very end of the decade still working that palette and looking far more grown up even though I certainly wasn't acting more grown up and here's UFH member Jane in a lovely purple ensemble and here's Tina as a child in dark magenta stripes another 80s color I want to talk about is teal teal was seen as a very smoky sexy sophisticated color that had a bit of an edge those 80s postmodernists loved teal. Look how often Basquiat worked in it. And here's a beautiful teal painting by David Sully. He's one of my favorites. Think of all the teal tones we find in cool and arty movies of the era like Blade Runner or The Hunger. And those Blitz kids, as well as loving purple, they loved the slightly sinister tone of teal. And if you were around in the 80s, I am willing to bet you had something in teal in your wardrobe. It was applied to all kinds of attire and was worn actually more than I remembered. When I asked the UFH Facebook group members for pictures of themselves in the 80s, I was surprised at how many were wearing teal. Here's Brenda in teal, Jen in teal and Carol in a teal bikini. Now, when teal gets lightened up, what does it become? Turquoise, another big color of the 80s, especially when teamed with purple. This is the palette of Blade Runner. It's the palette of Scarface. And when it hit the mainstream, boy oh boy are we in 80s territory now. And fashion loved this turquoise purple pairing. We saw it absolutely everywhere. It was ubiquitous. And here's the lovely Jane from the Ultimate Fashion History Facebook group in a fabulous turquoise and purple ensemble that her mother created for her and I would have sold my soul for in the 80s. Now, in a decade of denim, blue was of course a colour of such regularity that it almost went unnoticed. Yet, the era was also obsessed with stonewash, and so I think it's reasonable to cite the silvery hue of stonewash denim as a colour. So popular was stonewash that it was even applied to homeware, and here's our very own Danelle in her stonewash dungarees. But no matter how much stonewash denim we saw, it couldn't compete with all black. Now, my freshman students come to class thinking that the all black fashion palette began with the anti-fashion movement of the 90s. But as we all know, it started in the 80s. In terms of high fashion, the inspiration came from Japan, with designers like Yamamoto here or Rei Kawakubo for Comme des Garçons, this ultra chic, all black look, but it also came up from the street, from subcultures such as the Goths, who obviously wore all black. We should probably just take a second to talk about the 80s goth palette, because it wasn't really just all black, was it? There was the red of their lips and the white foundation on their faces, and much of their clothing was peppered with purple. Yet all black ensembles were soon worn by everyone at every level of fashion retail. On a fashion landscape dominated by primaries, brights, neons and pastels, black cut a very chic jib. And here is our very own Lois, representing from New Zealand in a marvellous all black outfit. Black was also used an awful lot in makeup, certainly goths relied upon it. But in my memory, when you went to buy an eyeliner in the 1980s, it had to be black. We all used a lot of black eyeliner. And if you think this is a lot of black eyeliner, check out how much black eyeliner I am wearing there. This is about 1988. My God, why do I have so much makeup on? To paraphrase Oscar Wilde, eyeliner is wasted on the young. <laughs> Less often, 
All White was actually quite popular in the 80s, and I think the inspiration for all white suits and ensembles definitely generates from the glamour of the 40s and the golden age of cinema. In the 1980s, fashion from the 40s was drawn upon with those big shoulder pads and dramatic silhouettes, and there really is nothing more glamorous than wearing all white. And when black and white were teamed, we get another classic 80s color combo. Here's Kim Wilde in black and white stripes. Here's Duran Duran in black and white stripes. Britain's ultra hip body map label used a lot of black and white. And remember those slogan t-shirts? They were always black and white it seemed. And look at this gorgeous diamond cut Bill Blast dress here. All this color and I haven't mentioned brown. Well, we don't really think of brown as an 80s color, do we? But think about the indie scene. Think about the Paisley underground. Think about bands like the Smiths. Denizens of the indie scene seldom wore brights or neons or pastels or even all black. By their very nature, indie artists had stepped outside of the mainstream and that included the mainstream fashion palette. And particularly trendy people did too. Here is UFH Facebook group member Letitia looking enviably cool in a palette of dark and light browns and black. And just in case you're interested, yes, we have an episode on Morrissey. So from those primary, secondary and tertiary colors to the neon palette, to the pastels and the purples and the turquoise and the adventure palette and the indigenous palette, holy moly, there was a lot of colors in the 80s. Just look at the screen for a second. Is it doing your head in? Well, the 80s itself wasn't quite so assaultive, but it was confusing. The palette you chose to wear often suggested the sort of person you were and your personal culture. And because there were so many palettes operating at the same time, it could get a little exhausting. It's no wonder then that the following decade was marked by a far calmer and arguably more considered fashion palette. Did you enjoy that? I feel like going and watching a black and white movie. So much color. Anyway, you can contact me through my website, amandahalley.com, or you can contact me through Instagram, the UFH on Instagram. Join that Facebook group. You can see what a riot we have over there. Check out our books at our publishing company, Dean Street Press. I'll be back very soon with more episodes on the ultimate fashion history. So just click that little circle to subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching. Bye for now.